Right everybody, we've been back out on the bike for the first time since the accident. I'm pleased to say, I'm very chuffed actually, that the bike is now roadworthy. I, well how long has it been? It's been six days since I unfortunately crashed the BSA. It's been a roller coaster of emotion. So first of all, utter despair, sadness, disappointment. And then the community piled in, as you saw in the second video, the 96 hours later video, I was just overwhelmed with all of the support and I'm pleased to say that the BSA's face is back to its, well, at least from a certain angle, like if you hide certain parts, but her main feature, the single round headlight is back to best. So I'm really pleased about that. There's a couple of things left to do. The exhaust, which hopefully we're waiting on a complete exhaust system to be able to replace those parts. And obviously the indicator in the front mudguard. Now the indicator and the front mud card are quite hard to get hold of. So luckily I've been in contact with Moore's Speed Racing, who you might actually know because they make a lot of custom parts for the BSA. They make a full exhaust system, which not the system I'm talking about, but it's either polished stainless or, or mild steel chrome plated. Now they've been customizing bikes and they've actually customized a Highland Green model. And as part of the customization, they got rid of this OE mirror indicator and front mud guard. So let's see, I mean, I've got to obviously give them some money for the parts. They were planning on keeping hold of them, but I'm wondering, and we've had a few emails back and forth, if they might release those parts, I'll, I'll give them a fair price for the parts and hopefully I can then have second-hand items for these three pieces and I won't have to wait for a, a d delay to get the parts uh, to me from BSA. The one thing which is going to remain on this bike and it's going to remain pretty much as a battle scar is the scuff on the binnacle. Now, unfortunately, these binnacles are a sealed unit. I can't dis dis disassemble this and take out the inner workings from the outer casing. If I want to buy the whole thing, it's £270. So I'm not going to do that for, for a scuff. It's part of the character of the bike. 5D Traveller, big shout out to him. He actually wrote in the comments that a similar thing happened to him with his motorcycle, nearly new bike, but it happened 50 years ago. He crashed that bike very recently after purchasing it brand new and he repaired it and he's actually kept that bike to this day. So the bike, he's, he's actually had the same bike for 51 years, which I think is amazing. Will I have this bike for 51 years? Who's to say? I don't know that for sure, but it is going to be a bike now that has a bit more story to it. I'm a bit fonder of it than perhaps I was before, especially when we get the final pieces done. It's just going to be a bike with more character. And it's a bike that's really shown me the spirit and uh, generosity of the whole community. So what's not to like, should we say, about the whole thing? I wouldn't wish it to happen again, but seeing as it has happened, so much positives come out of it. So really chuffed, to be honest. All right, well, we do actually have a topic for today's video, and I want to talk a little bit about the hype marketing that seems to come alongside every new motorcycle launch. I have previously fallen for this hype marketing. I fell for it first time around with a BSA. I put a deposit down that was refundable on the BSA. I fell for it with the Kawasaki ZX4R. I thought 400cc inline four, hasn't been around for 25 years, this class of bike. I'm going to go for it. 
put a refundable deposit down. And in both cases, I, I think I kind of came to my senses just in time. And not that those these bikes are bad bikes, but I changed I had a change of heart and I realized that perhaps that wasn't the right time for me personally to invest thousands of pounds, 10 grand in the case of the Kawasaki on a new motorcycle. Since I've been doing this as well, I've been looking at bikes, reading about bikes, watching videos about bikes. I've, and I've come to identify this pattern that seems to happen every time a new bike drops. And it, it kind of goes something like this. A few months before the launch, there's spy shots of a new bike, journalists start whispering out rumors, and then the bike itself drops, usually at a trade show, um, maybe a, a, an event that the manufacturer hosts himself. That will be associated with promotional, um, online uh, marketing, plus uh, traditional print marketing like MCM, the, the, all of the magazines, and also a huge barrage, a blitz of social media posts on all the platforms, from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc., etc. Almost a deluge of information just overwhelming the senses with how exciting this bike is. And if you look at all of these different platforms, the messaging, the marketing, will all be crafting the same uh, directed message about what the bike is. Notice it won't actually be about what the bike offers in a technical sense, but more so it'll be how you will be, what, what kind of person you'll be if you own this motorcycle. Will you be adventurous? Will you feel joy? Will you feel at one with nature, with exploration? All of these kind of like things that everybody wants to be. We all want to be a certain way. We want to aspire to something. And the brands know this. And so marketing very cleverly manufactures this ideal that you might be able to be something or achieve something if you use their humble tool to do so. Of course, after the launch, you then have a couple of months and then price is revealed. And if you notice, they don't drop the price with the bike launch anymore. It seems to be a delay. The last few launches I've seen, the price is always TBC, and then I think they work out the level of hype, the crescendo of, of anxiety that people need this new machine in their life. And then I think they drop the pricing. It's actually quite interesting why that delay seems now to be the go-to SOP for a bike launch. After you've revealed the price, very shortly after you become able to make a pre-order of the bike, which then people pile in and pre-order, and then three to six months later, usually, in line with the British riding season. So you're looking at March, pay the balance and off you go to live your fantastic adventurous life. So I saw this pattern. I just thought, oh my God, that's the same pattern each time. And I've realized that perhaps this isn't the way to go. And let's take three examples. And I'll just pick three manufacturers. So I'm not picking on any particular one. Triumph with the 400X and the 400 Speed. Royal Enfield with the 452 Himalayan and BMW with the 1300GS. Now it's quite nice to compare all those three bikes because although they're different price points, well the first two are the same ballpark but the second, the, the final one is miles away, they're all adventure bikes and they all sell the message of adventure and excitement and exploration. If you looked at the marketing content of those three launches, it's all a pro rider in the Himalayas or some kind of very wild wilderness doing all sorts of riding that most of us could never hope to achieve. I could certainly never ride a bike off-road like that. And there, it, it just looks exciting. You've got like speeding uh, drive-by shots, dust trail coming off, just showing the backdrop of endless mountains in Mongolia, wherever they go. And then you've got um, all of the accessories they offer to help you be a, a, an adventurous person. And all three of these, these different manufacturers all follow basically the same pattern that I just outlined. If we look at these bikes, let's start with the Triumph. I don't think the Triumph, although it's a novel bike for Triumph, I don't think the 400s, uh, the Speed and the Scrambler, are that much of a game changer as compared to other bikes that currently occupy that space from the other brands. There are bikes out there that are already four, uh, 400, 350s, single cylinders, scramblers. You know, the Fantec 500, for example, is a 471cc. That's been out there, or 450, sorry, that is. That's been out there for ages, and people are already riding it. It's already taken green laning. 
But this Triumph comes along and everybody gets so excited about it. Triumph have let slip that there's been 12,000 pre-orders in India. Is it really 12,000? Um, because if it is, that's Triumph's entire bike sales that they do globally anyway. Let's move on now to the BMW GS. Is it better than the outgoing GS? Yes. The engine's up to 147 horsepower. It's 12 kilos lighter. The technology has changed. There's radar assisted cruise control. But the question is, do you believe you need all of that to have the adventure? Or could you buy a 1250 GS, saving yourself four or five grand, get one that's a few years old and, and have exactly the same experience? I tend to gravitate towards the former. With the new bike, I think they've done a real clever thing by dropping the weight to 12 kilos. That's something I actually really agree with. I think BMW are ahead of the game here. They've heard the complaints in the market that adventure bikes are too big and heavy. Think of the Africa Twin um, or the Ducati Multistrada. They're big old bikes. And rather than just increasing the technology with self-leveling suspension and stuff, BMW have cleverly realized that a weight saving is something good to advertise about. If you watched a video that Richie Vida put out showing he was taking a tour group all on these big bikes to the Picos Mountains and these guys took these uh, BMWs, uh, the GS, up these tracks that on a smaller bike, a little scrambler would have been much, much easier, would have been perfectly rideable for an average rider. These big bikes went up there, people were like teetering on the bikes uh, everybody was stressed up the eyeballs. There were men sitting on the side of the track, head in hands, really emotional. Bikes were dropped. And it was something where I think that a lot of people who watched that video just chimed in and said, yeah, these, these big bikes, they're not really suitable for off roads on loose material, steep inclines. You've got full luggage on them because you've toured down to Spain. And if you're not the type of rider who can utilize the bike in that environment, then you need something lighter. And I think someone like um, Nathan the Postman really like what he does. He focuses on lightweight adventure bikes. That's, that's I think, where things are going. So I think BMW's marketing, actually on the weight saving, that's a feature which is in line with what the market's gonna want. Radar assisted cruise control. I read a line in Ride that just said, yeah, you really, get, you really can't function without radar assisted cruise control these days on UK motorways. I just thought, really? Is that is that like actually what average man on the street thinks that you need radar assisted cruise control to ride a motorcycle on a UK motorway? It it just isn't the case. I just don't agree with it. And finally, let's turn to Royal Enfield. Well, we've got the 452. It's been described in the marketing by the, the print editions, all the online articles, the influencers, as a once in a generation bike. And I, I know it's an improvement on the 411. I know you've got the inverted uh, shocks at the front, liquid cooling, 40 horsepower. It's 200 kilos, which I think is five kilos lighter than the, the outgoing Hemi. But is it a generational change? That engine, like I say about the Triumph, other manufacturers can make an engine with, with that's a 450 that puts out 40 horsepower. In fact, a 471cc in my old bike was putting out 47 horsepower from a twin. So to have 40 horsepower out of a 452 is not actually that groundbreaking. It just is in comparison to the previous Himalayan, it's quite a lot of horsepower. It's whatever it is, 80% increase on the old bike. That says more about the old Himalayan. Similarly, you've got ride by wire, you've got the TFT screen, you've got LEDs all around. Are those things which are actually needed for you to experience the same feeling of taking a Himalayan down a green lane. And the only reason I'm putting these questions out there is because the new Himalayan is four, five, no, that's a, that's a Freudian slip. It's 5,700 for the base model, 6,300 for the top spec model with the tubeless tires and the other bits. So Nick J, credit to you, my man. You actually said that the bike was gonna be 5,700. I said five and a half grand. You said it'll be a couple of uh, hundred quid more. You were spot on about that. I was wrong and uh, fair play for you guessing that price exactly. But the end result of it is you're at 6,000, let's say 6,000. Okay, so we meet in the middle from the base to the fully spec model. The outgoing Himalayan, 
can now be had for £4,000 brand new, as one of the commenters in Freddie Dobbs' video mentioned. That's an amazing price for a brand new bike that's as capable and as loved as the old Himalayan. And don't forget, if you go in and buy a new Hemi, you're going to have to buy all your accessories again. The engine bars, the luggage, all of that, I very much doubt will be transferable from the old bike. Add to that, if you are going to uh, trade in your old Hemi, well, imagine if they're £4,000 new, for your Hemi that's got 7,000 miles on it, you're going to get about 1,500 quid. You're going to get hardly anything on a trade-in with a dealer. It's going to be difficult to sell a bike at this time of year. So really, you're going to be paying, let's say you get two grand generously, we'll say you get two grand for your, for your old Hemi. You're going to pay 4,000 to have a bike that basically has got more power, a screen and liquid cooling and maybe the suspension's a little bit better. I don't think it's a game changer. I don't think it's a once in a generation bike. And if I had an old Himalayan, I think I would stick with the old Himalayan and just ride that like I've been riding it. So final thoughts, what do you do really uh, when we're in this kind of whole world where everything's, a, everything's commercial, everything's kind of rampant capitalism. We're trying to buy, or they want us to buy new all the time. I'll probably just hold off. I'll probably wait until Bikes are in uh, showrooms. You can sit on the bike. You can take out the demo unit. Let the new, let the uh, the riders that want to take on an absolutely new product. Let them take that on. Just hold fire. Keep your keep your powder dry. I wait. I mean, I waited two years for the BSA. I got this bike at the price I wanted to pay for it. I didn't pay the new pricing. And just wait for that bike to get into the hands of more riders, uh, owners groups, people on YouTube who perhaps have the smaller channels. They'll test ride it, just let you know what they think. And if you go on an owner's group, you'll get absolute warts and all opinion of, of the new bike. Let's wait. Let's wait and see if the new Hemi and the Triumph in particular, I know people have piled in the pre-orders on those bikes, but let's see if when the owner's groups start reporting uh, back, let's see if the, how these bikes are, see if there's any complaints. Um, and I, I'll just be interested to know, I've made this video now, Let's wait six months and we'll revisit and have a look at those two new bikes and just see how the market has reacted when they're actually in the hands of people out riding them. I guess, yeah, just be a little bit guarded. I mean, it's your money. You've worked for it. You've saved up. Money's hard to come by these days. And a nearly new bike can give you the same level of enjoyment and you can make a decision based more on the pros and cons of any particular motorcycle. I don't particularly think that there are bad bikes these days. I think all bikes are built to a price, but there's never a bike that you'll buy that, that leaks oil or the engine explodes itself, you know, after 500 miles. They're all built to a certain level of standard these days, new bikes. I just feel a little bit jaded that the hype, uh, almost the, the kind of messiah complex that some new bikes have, is just a little bit unfair that people push uh, this kind of idea on, on potential owners. So guys, let me know what you think in the, in the comments. Do you agree with this? Do you think I'm being a little bit maybe harsh on some of the new models coming out? Do you buy brand new bikes each time or do you wait? Do you have a bike that you've owned for 10 years? Or in the case of 5D Traveler, do you have a bike that you've owned 50 years and you still love it now as much as you did when you first uh, put a leg over it? All right, guys, well, I'm gonna ride home now. My tires are stone cold, so I'm gonna be gentle as I can be. So wish me luck and I will see you in the next one.